to the session um, on revolutionary ecologies. So we have three speakers. Um, we're going to start with Natalie Suzelis, then we'll move to Larry Lohman, and then Angela Serrano. Um, you have about 18 minutes with the time. So uh, Larry, I'm not sure you can hear me, but he can hear you. I will come flash cards in front of you. Hopefully you can time yourself with the computer. But if necessary, I'll come flash a, a time ahead of you. <laughs> um, just to avoid you know, uh, the awkwardness of these moving bodies. Um, OK. So uh, Natalie is coming to us from Carnegie Mellon University, and will be speaking on gender, the commons, and uh, Rojava. So turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for having me at this wonderful conference. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Rojava and, um, again, gender and the commons. Uh, and this is a bit of a tall order because, of course, so much has been written uh, on the left about Rojava recently. Um, and there's people have a lot of opinions about it, uh, whether or not they're doing it right, if it's Marxist enough or Leninist enough or Maoist enough. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, so we can get into some of the, the more recent articles, but I've saved them for later, so we can get into some of uh, this content here. Um, if you are interested in following uh, Rojava online, uh, there are actually some pretty helpful Facebook pages or just interesting pages that are updated with almost up to up to the minute content. The Women's Revolution in Rojava, Rojava Solidarity Worldwide, and Kurdish Female Fighters, the YPJ, uh, which is the Women's Protection Units. Uh, you can also follow ypginternational.org, um, which has a sort of streaming column of up to the minute news about marches and uh, parades, and uh, as well as uh, skirmishes and, and uh, recent deaths uh, in um, the struggle. And so I've uh, chosen this picture to, to start off with, which did, did come from the Women's Revolution in Rojava Facebook page. Um, and uh, mostly because, of course, it does uh, sort of showcase the uh, YPJ, the female fighters, but also because it has Abdullah Achalan uh, in the background. And I'm really interested uh, in him as a figure and how he's sort of guiding a lot of the ideological um, ideas behind this movement, uh, his sort of uh, history and uh, genealogy of patriarchy and capitalism. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to get into and hopefully uh, supplement it with some theory from uh, Maria Mi, Sylvia Federici, and Massimo DeAngelis. Um, so just a quick sort of crash course. I was going to get into this much more deeply, but uh, I feel for the, the sake of time, uh, we can just sort of cover this. I feel like uh, a lot of people have been sort of following the goings on for a while. Um, most people probably know that between 2006 and 2011, uh, there was a horrible, horrible drought. Uh, and climate crisis in Syria, people flooded into the cities. Um, the Assad regime absolutely could not deal with it. And we have all of the sort of worst, some of the most horrific uh, sort of repercussions of the Arab Spring uh, in Syria. Um, and I'm sure we're somewhat, most people are probably somewhat familiar with that. DeAngelis mentions that uh, crisis in the very beginning of his book, uh, Omnia Sunt Communia. Um, but that's the only time Rojava shows up in the book. And he uses it in the beginning to talk about, um, he quotes the Pentagon, uh, who's talking, which is talking about this crisis as um, a, an example of why the state needs to pay attention uh, to climate crisis and, and climate change. So I was interested in the fact that Rojava didn't really come up um, in uh, Federici uh, either. Um, so I'm going to uh, try and sort of do a bit of a comparative analysis of uh, Maria Mies and Federici and D'Angelis with uh, some of the, the cultural texts. So the reason why I, I have all these sort of keywords here, I think if you try to research this online, um, I'm really interested in the way that social media uh, has been involved in the sort of dissemination of information about Rojava. So again, those uh, Facebook pages, I don't think we should dismiss them because I think there's a certain amount of cultural weight uh, and just how much information uh, has been spread around um, about this struggle. Um, and so if you are uh, just interested in this topic and you sort of Google or search on uh, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, these keywords are the ones that typically uh, come up. And so you get a lot of, uh, of uh, information about autonomy and democratic confederalism. Ajalon read Murray Bookchin. 
Um, and so there's a lot of energy in anarchist collectives around the world that are showing solidarity uh, with, um, with the, the sort of uh, the YPG, the YPJ, uh, and the, the PYD. And so um, I have these here. Let's see if I have a cursor. Okay, um, so obviously uh, the Kurdish question and the sort of Kurdish diaspora uh, through Turkey, Syria, uh, Iraq, and Iran uh, is a lot bigger than the three cantons which people are frequently uh, speaking of in terms of um, the, the Rojava um, uh, geographical component. So we have Afrin, Kobani, and Jazeera. Um, I also put Connoisseur there at the, at the end of that map because I read something recently uh, where the town of Connoisseur uh, is, is trying to be annexed into that canton. Um, I also have these two maps. Um, so they're reproduced from this text, the Rojava Revolution in Syria and Kurdistan. Um, and it shows kind of the, the struggle uh, for land uh, from 2015 to 2016. So you can see that these cantons uh, joined up um, in terms of uh, sort of having a autonomy over this region uh, as they're fighting both the Turkish state uh, and the Islamic state um, or ISIS. So this, these are all sort of things that will pop up, but you'll also hear things about feminism and ecology um, and anarchism and resistance and things like this. Um, so especially, <laughs> If you've ever gone into a sort of YouTube rabbit hole, um, which I have frequently in terms of uh, what is kind of being talked about in anarchist circles, uh, I'm interested in this video, which is uh, which has been I've seen circulated on different kind of solidarity networks. Um, it is from Arms TV. It's called the the From Rojava to Spain, the Women's Struggle is Connected, uh, and it's a Spanish anarchist collective. Uh, and I'll just play a, a second of this because it's not in English, I have a, a translation. Con el nuevo paradigma de Rojava, donde las comunas y asambleas populares aparecen en los tres cantones para hallar maneras de autoorganización y el nuevo concepto de autodefensa como método de resistencia. Ok, whoops. So, um, basically, this video is about three, three to four minutes long, and it starts out uh, with this man spraying an anarchy symbol on a wall. Uh, and basically, it's a call to action um, to follow this model, um, communes, popular assemblies, um, uh, as a method of sort of resistance. And I believe this video does even mention uh, democratic confederalism. Um, and so I'm interested in sort of the intersections of solidarity and how groups have started talking to each other over the issue of Rojava. You have socialists and communists and anarchists who are all sort of interested in this region. Um, and it has been, of course, called Libertarian Kurdistan, so there may even be <laughs> some moments where you can have uh, a bit of uh, dialogue uh, with Libertarians, which is obviously defined very differently uh, in America. Nevertheless, I think there are some kernels there uh, where a dialogue could be uh, fruitful. Um, and this video also mentions Achalan, uh, and so towards the end it says, the use of solidarity as a method of resistance, as demonstrated in the Kurdish liberation movement and in the case of Ajalan, who has managed to create a true social revolution uh, in Rojava. Um, so uh, whether or not you're on board with this kind of lionizing and putting uh, Rojava on a pedestal, I'm still interested in the way that these sort of cultural narratives have been influencing uh, leftist politics and ideology, uh, because I've seen it a lot over the past couple of years. Um, so also, um, if you are sort of interested in women's struggle and women's liberation, if you uh, Google these sorts of things in terms of what's going on, uh, you'll probably run into a website like this, the Kurdistan Women's Liberation Movement for Universal Women's Struggle. Ajalan, again, is all over this website, um, uh, as well as, uh, of course, YPGinternational.org. Um, and so they talk about him as, again, playing a leading role uh, for the sort of revolutionary direction of the Kurdish liberation movement particularly in terms of gender practice and feminism. And so I was so curious uh, about this when I was reading Maria Mies, who has a, a moment, a section in uh, Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale, where she talks about socialist countries um, and women in socialist countries, how they're often um, 
have very mobilized by the idea of liberation and revolution and frequently push out to the margins uh, at sort of once the, the struggle actually takes place. And she even mentions that, uh, you know, one, one problem with this is that we have these icons, uh, these male figures of Lenin and uh, Marx and, and Ho Chi Minh and et cetera, et cetera. And, and Achalan is also sort of put in that category. So as I'm sort of, as I was going through all these things, I'm thinking to myself, well, this is kind of exactly what she's talking about. Why is Achalan uh, sort of lionized as this feminist figure? Um, and so I did dive into uh, these writings. Um, so Liberating Life, Women's Revolution, and Democratic Confederalism are both published by the International Initiative, uh, Freedom for Abdullah Achalan, Peace in Kurdistan. Um, you really can't deny the kind of um, accessible information uh, that you can uh, get into if you go to a place like freeachalan.org. Um, people, I think, have, are, are interested in these ideas and talking about these texts in terms of uh, their relationship to this movement. So um, as strange as Liberating Life, Women's Revolution is, I am interested in, in doing a bit of a close reading with Achalan in terms of uh, his genealogy. Um, it's a bit of a sort of uh, her historical materialism or her, her historiography that he kind of uh, goes through and uh, it's really sort of upheld by a lot of leaders uh, in Rojava. Um, so here's the table of contents. It's not a long text, um, but you can see uh, it sort of goes all the way back uh, to what he sort of describes as uh, the, the sort of um, with the going like so the primitive socialism of the Neolithic era, uh, and he goes he talks about things in terms of phases. You have the hunter gatherer communi communitarian society, um, and then you get into a hierarchical patriarchal society, uh, the state and capitalism being extensions of uh, that old those older forms of uh, patriarchy. And he also argues I'd say the sort of million dollar quote here. Uh, he says it's through an enormous network of myth mythological narrative that every aspect of culture is cloaked in the relationship of ruler and ruled, creator and created. Society is beguiled into internalizing this mythological world and gradually becomes the preferred version. Um, and so frequently throughout this text, he says something uh, to the extent of we, we need an alternative program, uh, we need to sort of uh, deconstruct this myth uh, and, and rescue a, a different sort of history. Um, so. Um, and so also the other sort of uh, thesis that I get from this text I have at the bottom here. He says, if we, can, if we want to construe true meaning to terms such as equality, freedom, democracy, and socialism that we so often use, we need to analyze and shatter the ancient web of relations that has been woven around women, for there can be no other way of attaining true equality with allowance for diversity, uh, freedom, democracy, and morality. And I love this quote. This is actually my favorite quote from the text because it's, uh, I teach gender uh, studies, and so equality with due allowance for diversity uh, is quite a feminist thing to say in sort of the, um, in terms of Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, uh, all of these sort of feminist theorists who uh, argue that we should still keep the sort of idea of difference um, in our praxis. So very quickly, I'm interested in this sort of strange uh, history uh, that he gives us in terms of sexual ruptures. Um, so he talks about the sort of mythological conversion from mother culture, the first major sexual rupture being this uh, conversion from female divinity, uh, as well as the monotheistic religions. Um, and that again, so capitalism uh, and state hegemony and globalization, he uses words like this, imperialism, and he talks about how they're extensions of this and what he terms as the sort of uh, value system of the dominant male. Um, and so I'm, I'm constantly reminded of Mies as I, as I go through this. Uh, so I have the quote here, all these efforts to add the woman question to social theories or paradigms fail to grasp the historical thrust of uh, the feminist rebellion's attack on patriarchal civilization and patri pa patriarchy as a system. Um, so, uh, whether or not you think his text is sort of ridiculous or kooky or just interesting, um, the fact is that these ideas are frequently reproduced uh, in, for example, um, 
the Rojava Summit, the New World Summit. I think this was in October of 2015. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So, sort of in the interest of time. Um, Hedia Youssef, who was the former co-president of this uh, canton and also the current co-president of the Rojava Foundation, pretty much goes through his history verbatim and then gets to the end of it where he talks about the educational system uh, being a key part of kind of pulling apart uh, this uh, network of mythology and what he calls capitalist modernity. Um, he also is a very sort of optimistic, there's a third sexual rupture that Achalan talks about that he kind of, that he predicts and welcomes in terms of women's liberation. Uh, and so he talks about moving from capitalist modernity to democratic modernity, which can only happen with a true uh, women's liberation movement. Uh, and so I won't play you the, the video, but, but Yusuf absolutely reproduces uh, both his, his history, his genealogies, and his ideas. Um, and, and many of which, so this is basically what she goes through, this sort of uh, notion of primitive socialism, uh, especially in terms of the Neolithic era, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, agricultural revolution that uh, took place even in Mesopotamia and the, the sort of region between the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, which had such uh, meaning. Um, and so all of these sort of claims, private relationships inside of the group had not yet developed, food belonged uh, to all the children belong to the clan. Uh, you can see him sort of developing these ideas uh, that are um, a, a model for a, a sort of um, uh, autonomous uh, feminist um, movement. Okay, so this kind of goes along with, his sort of history goes along with uh, Mai's in terms of women's tools and men's tools. We're probably f pretty familiar with this text, so I won't go into all this sort of object relation um, that uh, she talks about. Um, they both agree also on this history of tools uh, and slavery, the enslavement of women, um, and the male monopoly over arms, um, as well as housewifeization, which Ajalan also talks about. Um, and so we're probably all pretty familiar with the subsistence perspective. Um, so again, I won't get into that uh, too deeply, but uh, Ajalan pretty much agrees uh, in terms of subsistence work and subsistence production that it has everything to do with nourishment here. Okay, so I think I have a short time left. So this is interesting to me in terms of reproduction, subsistence, and the politics of the common. So, so Federici talks about uh, commoning the material beings of reproduction, um, producing ourselves as common subjects, and De Angelis uh, also talks about the rules and the norms um, that uh, commoning uh, sort of requires. And this also kind of lines up with Mize in terms of ecofeminist praxis. Um, and let's see here. Uh, as well as the kind of value systems uh, sorry, that uh, we need to sort of use to, to, to combat this uh, mytho mythology of the, the male hunter, which Mai says pretty much uh, structures our reality. Um, okay, so the third sexual rupture that Achalan talks about is basically, as he terms it, killing the dominant male uh, in terms of this, uh, this oppositional value system. Um, and so uh, he says that capitalism and the nation state represent the dominant male in its most institutionalized form. Um, and again, uh, it is so interesting to me to actually hear a lot of these things coming out of uh, the literature and uh, the, uh, the content from this movement self-curated uh, by a lot of the people uh, directly involved through these Facebook pages, um, uh, et cetera. Okay. So I won't go into democratic confederalism, um, and I think I think I might uh, stop here. Except for I'll I'll leave I'll leave a question here, um, which is uh, basically um, Federici talks about how uh, the sort of dangers of kind of re-naturalizing the woman uh, question in subsistence work as being a sort of natural capacity of women. Um, 
while at the same time acknowledging that this whole history of struggle and work and subsistence work is an integral part of, of uh, our history. Um, and so I guess I'll just leave it at the question of, uh, yes, Ajalan is extremely sort of kooky and strange uh, and even sometimes borderline gender essentialist when he talks about uh, the sort of female value system versus the dominant male. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering and sort of thinking out loud of, of how this might be, um, might be very useful uh, for the culture of Rojava in establishing this alternative system. Okay, so I'm out of time. Um, so I'll just leave it there, but thank you. All right, Larry, this is Jason here. I'm going to get you plugged in, and let's see, in two seconds we should have audio. Is it up there? Oh, all right. Let's see if we can make you even prettier, full screen. So glad, that, so glad that you can join us, Larry. Yeah, no, I'm really glad to, really glad to be here. All right, go ahead, Larry. You have uh, 18 minutes. Okay. Do you, do you have the PowerPoint set up there somewhere, or can I see it, or should I follow it on my screen? Let's see. What, which your PowerPoint or ours? Yeah. Um, uh, well, the one I sent to you. Okay. Let me see. 